Bibles, Psalm 18 is where we're going to be this morning, Psalm 18. I'm going to read this passage. It's a pretty long passage. Um, It's about uh, 50-some verses, so read along with me. Um, I will not preach on all 50 verses, I promise, Um, uh, but but read along with me. Psalm 18, verse 1, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. The ropes of death were wrapped around me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. I called to the Lord in my distress I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the Lord shook, then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the mountains trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils, and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down, total darkness beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, dark storm clouds his canopy around him. From the radiance of his presence, his clouds swept onward with hail and blazing coals. The Lord thundered from heaven, the Most High made his voice heard. He shot his arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at your rebuke, Lord at the blast of the nostrils of your nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me, and he pulled me out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me to a spacious place. He rescued me because because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanliness of my hands. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I let all his ordinances guide me and have not disregarded his statues. I was blameless toward him and kept myself from my iniquity. So the Lord repaid me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands in his sight. With the faithful, you prove yourself faithful. With the blameless, you prove yourself blameless. With the pure, you prove yourself pure. But with the crooked, you prove yourself shrewd. For you rescue and oppress people, but you humble those with haughty eyes. Lord, you light my lamp. My God illuminates my darkness. With you, I can attack a barricade, and with my God, I can leap over a wall. God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He's a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock besides our God? God, he clothes me with strength, and he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me securely on the heights. He trains my hands for war. His arms can bend a bow of bronze. You've given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand upholds me. Your humility exalts me. You make a spacious place beneath me for my steps, and my ankles do not give way. I pursue my enemies and overtake them. I do not turn back until they are wiped out. I crush them and they cannot get up. They fall beneath my feet. You clothe me with strength for battle. You subdue my adversaries beneath me. You made my enemies retreat before me. I annihilate those who hate me. They cry for help, but there is no one to save them. They cry to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I pulverize them like dust before the wind. I trample them like mud in the streets. You've freed me from the feuds among the people. You've appointed me the head of nations, a people I have not known serve me. Foreigners submit to me cringing. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners lose heart and they come trembling from their fortifications. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. The God of my salvation is exalted. God, he grants me vengeance and subdues peoples under me. He frees me from my enemies. You exalt me from my adversaries. You rescue me from violent men. Therefore, 
I will give thanks to you among the nations, Lord. I will sing praises about your name. He gives great victories to his kings. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. You could almost do the benediction right there, just when you hear about how good and faithful God is, right, to his people. And this morning, we're beginning a new series. And in this series, we're looking at four different truths about God and what we really believe about them. And that when we really believe these truths, we can be crazy enough to believe that we can live differently and that our lives can influence the world around us. But the reality is that we, by human nature, don't believe these truths. And that causes us to live with no impact or significance and always wondering where and how change is going to happen in us and through us. The Christian walk, the becoming like Jesus that God desires that we looked at in Romans 8, what the Bible calls sanctification, begins not with spiritual disciplines or changing our behavior, but it begins, friends, by knowing these truths and every day believing these truths. Now, these aren't deep truths that um, you've never heard before. Um, you're not going to get some new deep insight over the next several weeks, but these are pretty simple truths. We're going to discover over the next several weeks, number one, that God is great. Number two, we're going to discover that God is good. We're going to discover that God is gracious. And finally, we're going to discover that God is glorious. Knowing and believing and living out these truths will enable us to live our lives with purpose and significance and meaning and value. So if we truly believe these truths, our lives will look different. See, the reality is all of us in this room, we struggle with sin. For some of you, it's something that's very visible that others can see. And others are, notice it, things like anger or bitterness or you have this tendency to create strife or division. Others of us, our sins are hidden. People might not be able to see it. It may be lust. It may be jealousy. It may be pride. It may be envy. Often the way that we deal with sin in our lives is we see something that's wrong with our lives and something that's against God's nature and something wrong and unhealthy. And what we typically do is either we ignore it and hope that it just goes away, or we paint over it and cover it up and hope that no one ever finds out about it. But we never get down to the real problem and address the root of the issue. So what we want to do over the next several weeks is to teach you and equip you to show you that in the act of sinning, there are at least four levels to sin. The first one is what we see. These are the behaviors, the attitudes, the actions that are sinful and opposed to God and his word. So on the surface, we see anxiety. On the surface, we see worry and stress and all those things that the Bible tells us that we shouldn't do. We see those sins. On the surface, you'll see me get angry when I get home and uh, the kids have left the house a mess. That's what you'll see on the surface. But underneath that, there's always something going on. There's a reason for our sin. Under our sins are our idolatrous desires. What's underneath is something we're trusting in, something we're hoping in, something we're believing in, and that ultimately has failed us. And that produces things like stress and worry and anxiety and anger. And then we have what fuels the sin. What fuels the sin are basically four idols that we all deal with in our lives. These idols include control, comfort, approval, and power. These are four things that fuel our actions and what we see with our lives. But underneath all of that is the source of our sins. See, it's easy for us to look at stress or anxiety and worry and say, don't do that. Stop worrying and everything will be okay. But what fuels our sins, the control, the comfort, the approval, and the power, the challenge is there, each one of these things are like a knife blade that is either going to glorify God or it's going to create idolatry in our lives. So, for example, control. Control could look in a positive way like stewardship. It could look like self-discipline. It could look like intentional living of saying, I'm going to be structured so that I produce well in my life. But on the flip side, it could be idolatrous, where we're 
trying to manipulate people. We're trying to dominate things in our lives and control it. Could comfort could look like resting in God and saying, God, you're in control. Or it could lead to an inappropriate desire to live for ourselves, always living for the weekend or living for vacation instead of honoring God with all of our lives. See, when you get to the source of what's going on, what is really underneath all that is that the truth is we start to doubt God's character. We willfully rejected his authority, and we've embraced this illusion of our own supremacy. We've started to think that the answer to our problems is us and that we are our hope. And what we see is that our answer to dealing with sin is not just to paint over it. It's not just to hope that it goes away. It's not enough to just simply modify our behaviors than to hope that we'll stop sinning. See, if we paint over it, we still haven't dealt with all the stuff that's beneath the surface. Our attempts to fix ourselves will keep us busy and striving for a holiness that's outward in fashion, but they'll never address the heart and what the gospel wants to do is address our heart and transform us completely. Tim Chester, who wrote this phenomenal book called You Can Change, said that humanity's problem is futile thinking, darkened understanding, and ignorant hearts. This is the cause of indulgence and impurity and lust. We sin because we believe that we're better off without God. We sin because we believe that God's rule is oppressive in our lives. We sin because we think that we will be free without God telling us what to do. We sin because we think that living for ourselves will offer us so much more joy and happiness than doing what God wants. And so we sin out of disbelief. We sin because we believe something that's not true. We sin because we believe our life is going to be better without God. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to go deeper than just the surface issues of addressing sins that we face, but go to the issues of unbelief about God. And we're going to deal with these four truths about God that we struggle with believing. See, we understand that behind every sinful behavior is a lie that we believe about God. And what we need, what needs to happen is that our vision of God must change. We need to embrace truth about God. The most important thing about you is what you think when you think about God. <coughs> See, our vision of God dictates our behavior. If we believe lies, we'll act in sinful ways. If we believe lies, we'll continue to dwell in sin. If every sinful behavior that we do is a lie that we believe about God, then obviously the pathway to change is not just having truth, but believing in it so much that we delight in it and it turns it into worship, and the result is that our lives are completely transformed. So the implications of knowing these truths are important. The first one, God is great. The implication of that is because we believe that God is great, we don't have to be in control. God is glorious. And because we believe that God is glorious, we don't have to fear others. God is good. And because we believe that God is good, we don't have to look to anyone or anything else for satisfaction. God is gracious. And because we believe God is gracious, we don't have to prove ourselves to anyone out there. See, practically every sinful behavior can be traced back ultimately whether we believe in these truths or not. So let's look at the first one this morning. God is great, so you don't have to be in control. God is great, so you don't have to be in control. See, for most of us, the greatest illusion that we deal with is the illusion of control. The illusion that we can somehow ultimately control our surroundings. This illusion that we can somehow control what's going on around us. I'm going to go way back now, but Jurassic Park has become popular again. But in the first movie, there was this scene where after the dinosaurs have started ripping up the island, the creator of the island, John Hammond, is sitting across from one of his scientists, um, Ellie. And John says to her, hey, once we get control again, it will change. We can fix things. And Ellie looks at, her, looks at him and says, you never had control. That was just an illusion. You never had control. See, the truth is we think we're in control, but it's just an illusion. And when we talk about control, we're talking about this unhealthy preoccupation about 
controlling and managing and manipulating our lives, our surroundings, and the people around us. It's an unhealthy preoccupation with control. Don't, don't get me wrong. We need structure. We need boundaries. We need rules. We need all those things, but it can get unhealthy. What we see is worry and anxiety and stress and busyness and frustration. Because we want to be in control, we keep everyone busy around us. We see manipulation. We see domination. domination. We see a lack of trust in anyone but yourself. See, if you're a control freak, you don't trust anybody. You don't trust that other people could do what you want them to do, and so you take over for them. We see this in marriages. We see this in our relationship with our children. We see this in our relationship with other people at church, in our job places. We see it in our preoccupation with money, how we're preoccupied by it. We never have enough. So we live to make more. We're stingy. We can be controlling in our home. Everything has to be clean. Everything has to be in its place. And if it's not, then all hell breaks loose. There's a balance there, right? Who doesn't want a home that's clean? Who doesn't want a nice home to come to? But when there's an unhealthy preoccupation to that, and how clean your house is determines how you're going to behave and your emotions, there's a danger there. Each of these things starts with doubting God's greatness. We doubt that God is great, and so we think that we need to be in control. We doubt that he is in control of our lives. As I was preparing, I came across this public opinion poll of God's approval rating. It was a group of 3,000 Americans that were surveyed. 52% of them approved the way that God handled their lives. Nine were disappointed. 40 still wasn't sure what God was doing. 50% approved the way God handled natural disasters. 13% disapproved. 71 approved the way God made the universe. Not really sure what the other 21 or 29% would have done differently. Maybe eliminated spiders or snakes or something. But, um, but 29 didn't approve the way God created the universe. But the reality is when we are worrying, when we're anxious, when we're stressed, what we're saying is we feel this need for control. But what we're saying is, God, I don't approve what you're doing in my life. And so I'm going to be worried. I don't approve the way that things are going in my life or what you're doing, so I'm going to get anxious. I'm going to try to control. We're saying that, God, why don't you take a back burner and let me do this, and I would actually do a better job than you, and if you would just get out of my way, I will show you how to do it. And so when we try to do that, and when it doesn't go the way we want it to go, it creates stress and worry and anxiety because ultimately we fail. And we never get what we want. And so while I could say to you this morning, if you come to me and say, I'm worried, I could say to you, don't worry, don't, anxio don't be anxious, don't stress out. That's almost like putting a Band-Aid over it. It's never going to deal with the heart issue and the source of what's really going on in our lives. So let's look at our text this morning, Psalm 18. The psalmist was written by David at the end of many of his battles. And it's about how God had been great and victorious and caused him to be delivered from his enemies through these battles. And so David is writing to celebrate this. And David begins with this reality that both God's character and our circumstances are to lead us to prayer and dependence on God. Verse 1, I love you, Lord, my strength. He talks about his love for Jesus. And then he begins this list of attributes in verse 2. All these things that point us to something about God. He says, verse 2, the Lord, you are my rock. You're my fortress. You're my deliverer. You're my God, my rock, where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. All these metaphors that David uses here are pointing us to the reality that God is great, that God is strong, that God is this incredible fortress in whom we can trust, that he is this refuge that we could follow and believe. David is celebrating the reality of God's character, and he's saying that this should push us toward dependence on Jesus. This should push us to prayer because as he talks about this, he gets to verse 3 and he says, as I remember that God is my rock, as I remember that God is my fortress, as I remember that God is my deliverer, what do I do? I call to God who is worthy of praise. And when I do, I sing to my enemies. David talks about all these circumstances now and the situations that he's been in. 
They're dire situations. They're complicated. They're not simple, everyday, normal events. Look at verse 4. The ropes of death are wrapped around me. The torrents of destruction have terrified me. The ropes of Sheol entangle me. The snares of death confront me. David is going through some hard stuff here. Some of you are going through some hard stuff in life. The reality for all of us is that circumstances are hard right now, or they were just hard a while ago, or they're about to get hard. We live in a world that is fallen and broken. And so we have circumstances that are challenging. And so both God's character, who God is, and our circumstances and how dire they are, David is saying should push us toward God, not away from God. But the reality is, it's easy to remember our circumstances and forget God's character. And so we remember our circumstances and how, and how bad they are, and we become stressed, and we become worried, and we become anxious. Why? Because we've forgotten God's character. We've forgotten who God is. We've forgotten his greatness. And so David continues the remainder of the text talking about God's greatness and his greatness displayed. The metaphors that he uses and the things that he attributes to God's greatness is, greatness is tremendous. He talks about how God rocks the planets. There's earthquakes and thunderstorms and lightning and all this dramatic action that God is doing in the world. God's greatness being displayed for us. And David is saying that we believe in a God who is actually involved in the world, in every aspect of creation. Friends, our faith does not allow us to believe that God created a world and then he sits back and just watches things happen. Because Jesus does not allow us to believe that. We believe in a God that is all intimately, intentionally, actively involved in the universe. Go all the way down to verse 16. He reached down from on high. He took hold of me. He pulled me out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. I love this combination of God's greatness and God's tenderness. David's saying, man, even though you're great, even though you've made the heavens and the earth, even though there's lightning that strikes by the, your word, even though there's earthquakes and all the stuff that happens when you command the earth, even though you set forth lightning and thun thunder, at the same time, you're really tender. You come and you rescue me from my enemy. That you rescue me from those who hate me, from those who are too mighty for me. That, God, you are my support. What a beautiful picture of a God who is incredibly great, but also incredibly tender. See, I don't know about you, but it doesn't help me if God is close to me, if he's not that great. But it's also not a great comfort for me if God is incredibly great, but he's not close. David reminds us that God is great. He's great. He's powerful. He can change your situations like that. He's also super close to you. Jesus reminds us that he knows the hairs of our head. That he knows us by name. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. He is infinitely great and intimately close. One of the things that my kids love to do, especially Mike, is he'll climb on our six-year-old. He'll climb on top of the sofa or climb on top of the bed. And lately, he's been climbing on top of the kitchen island. And then he'll say, Daddy, catch me. Right? Um, <laughs> And I will, one, because I'm afraid of my wife, and then two, because I don't want to pay for the medical bills later, right? And so he'll jump, and I'll catch him. Why does he do that? Because in his naive mind, he trusts his dad is strong enough to catch him. He trusts his dad. We need to see God's greatness, and we need to experience God's tenderness in our lives that he is strong enough to catch us. And he loves us intimately enough to catch us. David is trying to help us see both. Jesus reminds us of this. He tells us in the Gospels, friends, don't be anxious about anything. 
Don't be worried about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll put on. Is not life more than the food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, Jesus says. They never sow, they never reap, they never gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he asks this important question, are you not of more value than them? If God takes care of the animals, will he not also take care of you? We need to trust in the greatness of our God. We need to trust in the tenderness of our God. So what do we do with God's greatness? Let me give you three things. Number one, we humbly trust God's greatness. We humbly trust God's greatness. Go down to verse 27. For you rescue and oppress peoples, but you humble those with haughty eyes. See, the most natural response to God's greatness needs to be humility. We humbly trust God. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So what he's saying is you need to acknowledge and admit that you are not God, but that you need him, that you need him. But humility does more than that. Humility is beautiful because of what it produces. Look at verse 28. Lord, you light my lamp. My God illuminates my darkness. I don't know a better metaphor that describes how I feel when I'm worried or stressed or anxious than the word darkness. It feels like the world is closing around me, and it feels dark. Scripture says when we humbly cast our cares and put our trust in God's greatness, God illuminates our darkness. Humility produces light because I could see God in the midst of darkness. But it does more. It produces courage. Look at verse 29. With you, God, I can attack a barricade. And with my God, I can leap over a wall. Humility produces this courage. When we humbly trust God's greatness, it produces great courage for us to trust and follow him. We, like my kids, can jump into his arms trusting that, God, you are going to take care of me. But the second thing, it produces a need to repent of the illusion of our own supremacy. Verse 31. Who is God beside our Lord? Who is a rock? Only our God. See, it's easy for us to read that verse and think about the things that we make into idols or the things that we find our security in. Things like money or people. But the truth is we need to include ourselves in that verse. I am not God. I am not a rock. My retirement is not my rock. My good health is not my savior. My God is, my family is not my God. My family and friends are not my true saviors. They'll be great some days, but there are days when even the best of them will end up disappointing me and failing me. Only God is the Lord. Only God, our God, is our rock. So how do we get from being a people that believe in God's greatness to a people that functionally believe in our own supremacy? Because we say things with our mouth and believe things in our minds, but we don't live that out in our lives. We can answer Bible trivia. We could say things like God is good and God is great and God is glorious and God is gracious. We know theology and we can correctly answer questions that people ask, but our lives are not based on those realities. On Sunday mornings, we will gather here and we'll sing of our belief that God has saved us and redeemed us and we're saved by grace. But then I'm singing and confessing and saying, I believe this. But then Monday morning comes and I feel the need that I have to prove myself. That I have to prove that I have done this by myself. I affirm God's sovereignty with my mouth and I can declare, God, you're good and you're faithful. But I still get anxious when I don't have control over my life sanctification when we are being made more into the image of Jesus is the narrowing of between what we believe and what we confess on Sunday morning and how we live our lives. It draws them closer and closer together where what we confess and how we live looks similar. 
I can't tell you the number of times where knowing and preaching that God is sovereign in my life, I can turn around and when something doesn't go the way I want it to go, that I can get discouraged and I can complain to God and I can often even get angry at God. Anyone else relate? Why do I do that? Because there's this gap between what I confess with my mouth and how I live my life. See, what God is doing in me and what God is doing in you is that he is sanctifying us. He is making us more into the image of Jesus, which we talked about in Romans 8. He is removing impurities from our lives through the power of his word and through the presence of his spirit. And he is bridging this gap between what we confess and how we live so that we will look and behave and act more like Jesus. That is grace. We don't have to be in control. Number three, we rest in God's greatness through prayer. Verse three and verse six both point to this. When we see God's character, we pray. When we see our circumstances, we pray. The problem is we don't have a good view of either one. We think that we can handle our circumstances, and we only pray when we figure out we can't. We see what's in front of us, we're like, oh, I got this. I can do this. I'm going to fix this by myself. And we can't. And we see God and his greatness. And we obviously don't believe that because we don't pray. See, we rest in God's greatness and believe that through prayer. And we believe that he's sovereign, but we don't live that way. And what we need to see is the reality of our lack of control in this world. See, I thought about this this morning. You woke up and you drove on the roads to church. For some of you, your roads were icy and wet this morning. And as you drove here, there were people next to you who were texting, emailing, putting on makeup, drinking coffee, all at the same time while driving on the road next to you. And maybe you were doing that. <laughs> you got in the car and none of you checked your brakes before you pulled out of the garage. You drove here with the illusion that everything was great, and yet there were so many things that could have happened that were beyond your control. I was just thinking yesterday that I flew on a plane more than I ever wanted this past year. Some of those were incredibly long trips, three trips that were over 17 hours on a plane. And while I'm sitting on that plane watching movies or napping or eating whatever plane food that they give me, the truth is I have no control over what could happen. There is this illusion of control, but the reality is it wasn't there. We think we're okay. We think we got it covered. But friends, it's insanity to think like that. There's so many things that are beyond our control. There's this great quote by John Calvin, which is really long, so I'm going to read it. It's beyond, it's behind me. Um, it says, quote, what else can be said where heat, oh, that's not it, yeah, where heat and cold bring equal danger? Then in what direction soever you turn, all surrounding objects not only may do harm, but almost openly threaten and seem to present immediate death. Go on board a ship, and you're a plank's breadth away from death. Remember, this is like 1600. So uh, mount a horse, and the stumbling of a foot endangers your life. Walk along the streets, and every tile upon the roof is a source of danger. If a sharp instrument is in your hand or in that of a friend, the possible harm is manifest. All the savage you, beasts you see are so many beings armed for your destruction. Even within a high wall garden where everything ministers to delight, a serpent will sometimes lurk. Your house, constantly exposed to fire, threatens you with poverty by day, with destruction by night. Your fields, subject to hail, mildew, drought, and other injuries, denounce barrenness and thereby famine. I say nothing of poison and treachery and robbery, some of which beset us at home, others follow us abroad. Amid these perils, must not man be very miserable? As one who, more dead and alive, with difficulty draws an anxious and feeble breath, just as if a drawn sword were constantly su su suspended over his neck. Calvin is saying, listen, we live in a world where there is no illusion that we're not in control of our lives. Walk out this door, and we have no control over what will happen next. And yet we want to rest in our control and in our security and in our plans instead of resting and trusting in God's plans for our lives. There are so many things that we can worry about, none of which we can control. And Calvin continues and he says, but when once 
the light of divine providence has illumined the believer's soul. He is relieved and set free, not only from the extreme fears and anxiety which formerly oppressed him, but from all care. For as he justly, for as he justly shudders at the idea of chance, so he can confidently commit himself to God. This, I say, is his comfort that his heavenly father so embraces all things under his power, so governs them by the will by his nod, so regulates them by his wisdom that nothing takes place save according to his appointment, that received into his favor and entrusted to the care of his angels, neither fire nor water nor sword can do him harm, except insofar God, their master, is pleased to permit. Friends, when you're faced with worry, when you're faced with anxiety, you can humbly trust in God's greatness. And if you believe the Bible, you could trust that all things work together for good, even though he wills they will work together for good. So because God is great, we don't have to be concerned. Because God is great, we can rest in his goodness and his grace. Because God is great, we can give up the illusion of supremacy and rest in what he has done what he is doing. He alone is our rock. He alone is our God. When we live, when how we live reflects what we believe, it transforms our lives. And we're the ones crazy enough to believe that we could please him because we trust in the great God regardless of what goes on. God is great. But you don't have to be in control. You don't have to be in control. So the next time you're worried, the next time you're anxious, the next time you're stressed, remind yourself, God is great. I don't have to be. That he holds me in the palm of his hands. That he has a plan and purpose for me. That's the promise of scripture. We think we're in control. We think that we could get our own salvation. We think that we can live good enough to be approved and accepted. And the reality is, God said, there's no way you would ever live the life that I expect of you. And so God, despite our illusion that we're in control, Scripture says that while we were still sinners, and screwing up our lives, messing up our lives, despite that, in that moment, he sent Jesus to eliminate any assumption that we think that we could save ourselves because Jesus shows us that there is no way we could come to the Father but by him. And so we're about to come to the table to celebrate communion, which reminds us week in and week out that we're not saved because of our righteousness. We're not saved because we have our act together, because we do well each week, because we're in control of our lives. We're saved because when we were a mess, God redeemed us. God rescued us. For some of you, communion almost becomes this ritual that you do week in and week out. But can I invite you this morning to soak in God's greatness? Be reminded that you get to celebrate that table because there was a God who loved you enough that was big enough, that was powerful enough to be able to redeem and save you, but he was also intimate enough that he was willing to kill you for it. Great God. He's strong, he's powerful, but he's great. And he loves you. He loves you this morning. When you come to the table this morning, can I invite you to spend some time with Jesus being reminded of God's greatness in your life Maybe this morning you came in here stressed. You came in here worried, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, listen, you're not in control, but I am. I am. This year, you're looking at this year, and you're saying, I've got all sorts of stuff coming up, and I have no idea how, where the answer is going to come from or what's going to happen. And God is saying to you, listen, you're not in control, but I am. I am. I'm in control of your life. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will watch over you. I'm in control of you.
Would you trust in his greatness this morning? Would you draw near to his greatness this morning? Would you put your hope and your confidence in God's greatness this morning? Father, we thank you that you are great. We thank you that you're in control. We thank you that you have, you are our rock, you are our fortress, you are our deliverer, you are our rescuer, you are our savior. We thank you that you're great. We thank you that you're close. That you love me. You don't just love humanity as a whole, but you intimately love me. That you know me by name. You know the depths of my soul. And you know how wicked I am, and yet you still sent Jesus to die for me, to save me, to redeem me, to, to get me off of my own throne and to put to come and humbly kneel before the throne of God and say, have your way. And so God, we pray this morning that you would have your way, that we would trust in your greatness, that we would become more and more like Jesus. God, would you be glorified in our lives through your word.